Luke chapter number 15, verse 11, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me, and he divided unto them his living. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country. And there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in the land, and he began to be in want. Verse 15, and he went and joined himself. Be careful what you get connected to. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country. And he sent him into the fields to feed swine. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat and no man gave unto him verse 17 is key watch me here and when he came to himself there it is right there that, that's the scripture that changes everything when he came to himself he said how many hired servants of my fathers have bread enough to spare and I perish with hunger I will arise I will arise and go to my father and will say unto him father I have sinned against heaven and before thee and am no more worthy to be called thy son make me as one of thy hired servants and and he arose verse 18 he's saying I will arise and verse 20, he says that he arose. See, if you start talking about it, you're going to do it. Mm. I will arise. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran. and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him and the son said unto him father I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight and am no more worthy to be called thy son but the father said to his servants bring forth the best robe and put it on him put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring hither the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and be merry for this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of the word. We are hearers today and by faith doers. And everybody said in Jesus' name, amen. amen. You may be seated. Well, how y'all doing? When I started this series, I really had no idea that there would be this many different streams of thought that would come out of this particular story. I was actually concerned that I might exhaust it rather quickly. But the more that I look at this, the more it begins to speak to me in a multiplicity of ways. The star in the story is, of course, the prodigal son. The father is the supporting actor. And usually when someone teaches from the story of the prodigal son, they more often than not focus all their attention on the son. And I'm definitely going to get to him today, but I want to take just a moment here and pause and shine some light today on part of the story that relates to the Father. Because I cannot help but wonder in reading and studying this text what it must have felt like to watch your son go through this situation 
knowing what he was doing, knowing the mistakes, understanding the failure that was ahead, and yet watching the situation through the eyes of a loving father. The son, let me back up. The son comes to the father and says to him, give me the portion of my inheritance that belongs to me. Now, I always thought, Bishop, that inheritance was something that they get after I'm gone. So, so this is a little strange to me because the father is still living and yet the son has the audacity to, to ask for his part in advance. And the Bible said that he divided to them, both of them, both of his sons, he divided unto them his living, his, his, his living. I, I think uh, it could be better said that he divided to them his life. Whatever he had accumulated over his entire life, his living means that he gave them all he had. That means that this father took everything that he had worked for his entire life and gave it to his sons. And I want to talk about this as it relates to family this morning. As a matter of fact, I really didn't realize how in-depth this story uh, pertains to the family till I really got in it. But I want, to, I want to talk about it as it relates to the family here for just, just a second because I want the young people who have parents that are working to provide for you to hear me. Perhaps they are helping to put you through school, helping with your car note and your insurance. You are everything to them. And they will do anything for you. And hear me today, young person, what I want you to see is they are giving their life to do that for you. See, the job your parents work is not really paying them for their work. They're paying them for their life. So in reality, your parents are giving part of their life to better you. Are you tracking with me this morning? And that's not to put you on any kind of a guilt trip in any way, but rather perhaps to give you a greater sense of appreciation and, and maybe a greater sense of gratitude in your heart to, to parents who have provided for you and kept clothes on your back and kept shoes on, on your feet. And, and I don't know, maybe it's just I'm getting older. And it's amazing how perception begins to change as you get older. I, I don't know, maybe it's that the older you get, you maybe appreciate things more. You see the whole panoramic view of life. You don't just judge life through a knothole in the fence. You can see, you can see it all. And, and you begin to realize that your parents could have spent that money on vacation. And they could have spent that money, you know, going to the Bahamas and, and laying in the sand or driving a better car or living in a larger house. But they sacrificed so many things. And parents who at times did without themselves so that you could have. And I'm just saying, I, I don't think that should be overlooked. I think it's something to be celebrated. I think it's something to be appreciated because... I'm trying to look at this story and imagine what the father must have felt like when he, he takes everything that I worked for my entire life to build and he takes, I mean, my 401k and my annuities and, and my IRA and he blew it. I mean, it would have been one thing if he would have taken it and put it in something that would have benefited him later in life if, if he would have taken it and put it in a mutual fund, if he would have taken it and put it in an IRA, if he would have bought a piece of property with it or something because if you begin to dissect this even more, I, I, I see it this way, that it was not only the material things that he squandered but as a parent I think the most valuable thing that you could ever give your children is your insight your wisdom, 
the things that you learn, the things that you gained through the years in knowledge. I, I, I always say it this way. Don't, don't just give your children things. But rather give them what made you who you are. Give them the thing that made you take a licking and keep on ticking. You, you, you need to give them the thing that when, when life got hard, that you reached down inside of you and pulled yourself back up and kept pushing. That's the stuff that they really need in life. Talk to me in here. I, um, I still to this day can hear, hear my father in my ear saying things to me that, that molded me and shaped me and taught me how to be a man and taught me how to be a father. Th things that saved me from wasting years of my life. That is the value of having a father or having a father figure is they can take 20 minutes with you and that 20 minutes can save you 20 years. Ah. Uh, See, this boy not only wasted his father's money and his wealth, but he wasted everything that his father had put into him. To me, that's the, that's the harder part of the story because there's nothing any more heartbreaking as a parent than to work 60 hours a week and deal with what you have to deal with with people on your job to keep working there and yet you provide for your children and you go to the games and you pick them up from the practices and, and, and let me just say there's nothing more devastating to a parent than after giving their life for their children to watch their children grow up and, and squander and waste their life. There's nothing more disheartening as a parent than to give everything to something I just want you to feel what the father felt when the son walked out the door with his life the bible said he spent it on riotous if there wasn't kids in here, I could make it plain. That, that's what he, he spent it on. He, he spent it on people who cared nothing about him. They cared nothing about his person. They cared nothing about his future. He spent it in the club. He gambled it. He gave it away to impress people who, who didn't even like him. He spent it on people who used him for what they could get out of him. They used him for his money and they used him for his car and they used him for what they could get out of them or what he could do for them. People who you never hear about them again in this text. So I'll say again, I think the most difficult part of this whole story is the fact that a loving father has to sit back and watch it all go down. <laughs> and he can't say nothing. I want to take a moment right here and talk to the parent that may feel like everything you put into them and everything you wanted for them and everything you gave to them, it seems like it was for naught. I, I want to... I want to talk to the parent maybe in this house or that's watching me online. I want to talk to the parents who perhaps may be watching your children make decisions that you know are not the best decision for them. I, I, I want to talk to the parent that you see your children acting like they weren't raised in your house. I, I, I want to talk to, the, I need to talk to some real people in here. I don't, I don't need to preach to the churchy folks. I need to talk to the real people. I, I want to talk to the parents who, who have had to stand by and watch your child make choices that you know is going to hurt them down the road and it can be heartbreaking more than any experience of your life because they are your life. And yet I want to say this morning that your children will reach a place in life that you can no longer choose for them. I mean, you can pray for them and you can give them advice and you can model right decision making in front of them, but there's going to come a day when they are going to have to make the decisions and it's out of our control. Can I keep pushing? 
Because even as it pertains to faith, you can raise a child to love God, to serve God, to be in the house of God, and yet they can get connected to certain people that don't believe the same way or they don't value the same things and, and, and they can find themselves in relationships with people and, and you know that they are not what your Bible calls equally yoked together. They have a different belief system. They, they have a different worldview. They don't see church like you see church. They don't have the same outlook on life. That is unequally yoked. I'm going to work this today because they used to use that scripture back in the day to say that you can't marry somebody that doesn't look like you. But that scripture isn't talking about you marrying someone who, who has a different pigmentation to their skin than you do. It's talking about your faith. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. He's saying don't get caught in covenant with someone who doesn't share your same beliefs. Listen, I pray for my children every day for them to be saved. I pray for them every day because God forbid I give my entire life to the gospel of Jesus Christ and yet have to sit back and watch my children or should God tarry his coming, my children's children walk into a church where it's filled with a form of godliness but it has no power. It has a steeple that pierces the atmosphere, but nobody's getting healed and nobody's getting delivered and nobody's getting baptized in the Holy Ghost. Talk to me in here. It is the desire for every parent to watch your children walk in truth. Matter of fact, 3 John chapter 1, verse number 4, the writer said, I have no greater joy I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. I think the hardest thing that the father has to do is watch it all go down, watch it all play out, see it all unfold, and yet have to walk over and sit down. And wait it out. Oh my God. This is even hard to teach this morning because we're living in a society that we want instant everything. We want instant grits. We want instant potatoes. We want instant cornbread. My Lord, I didn't understand why some people didn't like grits till I ate some that my mama didn't fix. And I said, my Lord, what did they do to these? Uh, Listen, you, you can get microwave grits in five minutes and you can get them quick, but they're not going to taste like you, you, your grandmama made them. Say something to me in here, because as a matter of fact, your grandmama didn't even have a microwave. She had a black cast iron skillet, but she knew how to use it. Come on, talk to me in here. E even the old folks used to say, he may not come when you want him to but they'll say he'll be there why because God is faithful I had a first cousin she's more like a sister to me we were, we were all raised so close together and I remember my aunt calling me one day she was so concerned about her she was so worried about her she had been pulled away from God and pulled away from the church and my aunt was crying profusely and I remember I said don't worry about Leah I said God's got a hook in her mouth today she's the wife of a pastor and she and her husband are pastoring a great church and doing a great work for God. And that's a wonderful testimony to the faithfulness of God. And I know I... I know I told it to you in a few seconds. But here I come. Because the turnaround didn't happen in a few seconds. 
and the change didn't happen when I hung up the phone. As a matter of fact, it didn't even happen for the next few years. It looked like it was touch and go there for a little bit. It looked like too little too late. But let me just stop right here and say, it ain't over till it's over. And let me add something else to it. With God, it ain't ever over. Why? Because God is faithful. God is not a man that he should lie. Neither is he the son of man that he should repent. Hath he said it and shall he not do it? Hath he spoken it and shall he not make it good? I got to tell somebody here today, God is a faithful God. And I think he's worthy of a great ovation of praise here on a cold Sunday morning. Yes. I love that scripture in Hebrews where the Bible, speaking of Sarah, says she judged him. She judged him faithful who had promised. It's one of my favorite verses, I think, in all the Bible because she didn't care what the jury had said and she didn't care what the judge had, had ruled and what the verdict was. She said, I've already looked at the evidence for myself and I came back with a report that God is faithful. Look at your neighbor and say, God is faithful. David said, I once was young, but now I'm Smile at me, y'all. I once was young, but now I'm old. But what did he say? I've never seen the righteous forsaken. I've never seen his seed begging bread. I just want to encourage somebody here today. Trusting God is trusting God when it doesn't make sense. I need a little help now. Because trusting God is trusting him when all of the evidence is pointing in a different direction. But you still choose to believe God. Sometimes the hardest part is not believing. Sometimes the hardest part is waiting. I'm sick in my body, but I feel the anointing of the Holy Ghost on me right now. I think sometimes the hardest part is having to sit around and, and, and look and watch it all play out and think to yourself that it will never turn around. Hardest thing you'll ever do in life is waiting. Waiting on somebody to love you. Waiting on somebody to miss you. Looking at your cell phone, checking your text messages. Hoping they sent you just a little something. <sighs> I got to talk about this because the waiting is heartbreaking. Because the waiting creates worry. And I don't mind waiting if I could just wait in peace. <laughs> But it comes as a double whammy. It seems like every time that waiting comes, worry comes with it. Because our human nature is to think, what if it doesn't work out? And what if my children don't make it back home? And, and what if they don't get back? I, I, I know what you're thinking, but I, I, I got to preach to somebody. I feel, I feel this thing in here. I, I've got to talk to somebody and tell you when you've done everything that you know to do. Some of you prayed and they got worse. You spoke in tongues over it and they got worse. You put them on the altar and on the prayer wall and you did a little, you know, Jericho walk around their house and everything just continued to get worse. What I've come to talk to you about today, I know what to do when you're praying, the answer comes, but what do you do when you're praying and it gets worse instead of better? See, I think, I think the, the thing that we don't understand is what the waiting produces in you. They that wait upon the Lord. What? Shall renew their what? You know what that tells me? That tells me that waiting is what wears you out. It's waiting. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength because in the process of waiting, I have worn myself out. Because in the process of waiting, you can feel like you have exhausted every resource that you have and you feel like you don't have any strength to keep going. And that's why the Bible said, having done all to stand. 
You just got to keep on standing. Hey. I got to give the Father some props here this morning because, whoo, the thing I love about him is that he had the ability to be patient and let God work. Ah. And it ain't easy to preach, but I'm going to preach it anyhow. Sometimes the hardest thing in the world is to be patient. To sit back and keep your mouth off of it. Keep your hands off of it. And let God work what he's trying to work. Even, watch me right here, even when it looks like you're losing the fight. You've heard me say, faith that cannot be tested is faith that cannot be trusted. And some of you are going through a testing of your faith right now. But be not weary in well-doing. You will reap. You will reap in due season. Come on, talk to me in here. Even when it looks like everything is getting worse instead of better. To, 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 to be a parent and even uh, you've done everything you know to do and your son is still on crack. done everything that you know to do and your daughter is still bound by alcohol and you get the calls at 3 o'clock in the morning and you go to pick her up and she's laying in the grass and there's vomit in her hair and you know what hurts is that's your baby girl <laughs> that's your baby girl that's drinking and drugging and cutting herself that's, that's your baby I don't care how old she is that's still and it wouldn't hurt so bad if you hadn't tried so hard. And yet you watch them, you watch them, you watch them choose relationships over your relationship. And you watch them choose friendships over your friendship. And you watch them push you out of their life. Mm. See, this story is it's really not just about the love of this prodigal's father. Because everybody doesn't have a father that loves them like that. The real story in this is about the love of our father. For God so loved the world. Y'all better say something in here. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not Watch this, watch this right here. Because all this is going on with his son and yet he is willing to trust the process of God and not say a word. Whew. Never charges God foolishly. Never blames God that it seems like God isn't intervening in the situation. I want to talk to somebody here today and tell you, trust the process of God over your child's life. Trust the process of God over your grandchildren's life. I know it's killing you because you're trying to talk to them and they can't see it, but hear your pastor, they can't see it until they see it. And can I, can I just be plain right here? You couldn't see it either when you were their age. Oh, come on, talk to me in here. Your, your rules, some of you, your rules are greater than your love. Somewhere you have to, oh my God, have mercy. Somewhere you have to put some rules aside sometime. Because the Bible says, with patience you possess your soul. Let me come at it like this. I think the only way sometimes when you go through situations of life that are killing you, the only thing that keeps you from losing your mind and having a nervous breakdown is that you have to take those situations. The situations in your life that you cannot control and you have to place them in the hands of an all-knowing, all-seeing, omnipotent, omnipresent God. And you have to leave them there. 
I always wondered why my grandfather, one of the most Christ-like men I've ever met, I always wondered how all kind of stuff could be going on in the family. And he would walk in that bedroom and he would kneel down by that bed and he would pray his prayers and he would get up and he would lay down and he would go to sleep and he would give that thing to God. You have to know, come on church, you have to know that you're going to bring fruit. You're going to bring forth fruit in your own season and that your leaf will not wither and whatsoever you do will prosper. What I'm trying to tell you is today that God is not finished with them yet. Oh, I wish I had the strength to preach it. Because what happens is when God begins to deal with them in this way, we try to stop it. Well, that's been wanting to do that all day. It finally went on and did what it's going to do. Thank you, Scott. Just take it with you, Marcus. I promise I decided my eye. I thought you were Scott. Have y'all been hanging out together so much now? That y'all starting to love y'all. A brother from another mother. Is that what it is? Hey, your pastor right now. When God starts to deal with him in that way, we try to stop it. But, but, but watch me, watch me. We have to let them make their own mistakes. And yes, it's going to hurt them, and yes, it's going to cause them pain, and yet you better know they're going to regret it. But if you get in the way, and you try to stop it, they're going to, they're going to blame you for it. And that's why as hard as it is, can pastor teach this morning, as hard as it is, you have to take that situation, you have to take that person, and you have to place them in the hands of God, and you have to release them, and you have to know that the God who has begun a good work in them is going to perform it to the day of Jesus Christ. Come on, Hannah, sometimes you got to leave Samuel on the altar, and you got to walk away no matter how hard it hurts. Because God is going to finish what he started in them. Walk with me right here. I know they're making bad decisions right now. But can I tell you that even those bad decisions are a part of their process? And if you take any of that away from them, they won't be as anointed as they're going to be. They won't be in the kingdom of God as strong as what they would have been. You know what I think we need to do? I think we need to quit worrying about a bed, worrying in a bed that we paid for. And we need to close our eyes and we need to go to sleep and we need to rest in God and place them in the hands of the Lord and quit worrying about stuff we can't fix. And just walk in here and give God a praise in advance because his credit is already good with you and you know he's going to work it out before it's over. I need some people with that kind of radical faith to throw a praise in the atmosphere of this house. Yeah. If you got kids that are away from God, look at your neighbor and say, they're still in the palm of his hand. Look back at him and say, and the devil isn't going to drive me crazy over it. I have lost my last night of sleep worrying about what I need to do to fix it. You know what? I gave that child to God when you gave them to me. And so I, I've got to have faith enough to know that the steps of a good man, the steps of a good woman, the steps of a good young person, they are ordered by the Lord. Ah! Can, can I push on this just another minute? Because to really, to really understand this story, there's so much in this text. To really understand this story, you have to understand the culture of the Jews, and you have to know that there is nothing more loathsome in the eyes of a Jew than a hog. Oh, I'm preaching to city folk here today. Y'all don't know nothing about no. Any country folk in here, you know, you know something about a hog pit? There ain't nothing in the world smells any worse than, than I grew up in the country and when neighbors would get in 
you know, little arguments with each other, they go on the corner line of the property and they put a hog pen right there and put a bunch of stinking hogs in it because in the country we slept at night with the windows up and a box fan in the window. Am I talking over your head? And when that wind was coming out of the south, it'd come across that hog pen and blow that hog pen right up in your bedroom. And it would create a, oh, you talk about Hatfield and McCoys ain't got nothing on. I got a prodigal. He's not, he's not just talking about one. He's in one. Not just around it. He's in it. And what I got to tell you is, uh, uh. Now he's been exposed to things that he never was exposed to in the father's house. Mm. See, there's a lot of people that look at, at covering as if it's holding you back. Covering isn't holding you back. Covering is protecting you. Ah! Huh? There's a certain protection that comes in the father's house. And now he's uncovered. Now he's fair game for the enemy to attack. And the Bible said he's in this hog pen. He's, he's not just near one, he's in one. And the Bible said that he fain would have filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat. And I know that sounds nasty. But you can't get low enough. That stuff that was never attractive to you before. Stuff you saw other people do and you said, I'll never do that. Stuff that you hated before, now you can't stay away from it. Things you said you would never do, and you find yourself in the middle of it. He fain would have filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat. And here we go, I'm not upset at the prodigal today because he's just hungry. He's just hungry and desperate people do desperate things. And here's what's awesome about this story is all the while he's hungry in a pig pen, there's food enough to eat in the father's house if he can just get back home. And when he came to himself, He had an epiphany when he came to himself. And let, let, me, let me just say here right, let, let me say right here, it, it can happen anywhere because it doesn't have to happen in a church service. It doesn't have to happen in the Bible class. It doesn't have to happen in a prayer meeting. It can happen in a club. Oh, y'all ain't got to say nothing. Just look straight ahead and act real confused. But how many of you knew wherever you went, God was after you? <laughs> wherever you tried to get away, you could run, but you couldn't hide because God was always there. I knew a guy that God had called him to preach when he was a young man, Byron, and he ran from God for years, and it got to the place where he was so miserable, he started turning to alcohol, and he was sitting in a bar, and he was drinking, and one of his drinking buddies come in and sat down on the bar stool next to him and said, man, you're not going to believe this, but I had a dream last night, and in my dream, I saw you up preaching, and that man started you talk about crying in your beer. He started weeping and crying and he said, I was repenting before God sitting in a bar. L listen to me. He'll come anywhere. He'll come anytime. He'll come any place. He'll come to anybody. You, you, look at somebody and say, you can run, but you can't hide. Mm. Let, let me just say, is there anybody here that ever came to yourself? You had gone as far as you could go. But you came to yourself. He came to himself. And I love this because when he came to himself, he starts talking to himself. Uh, and he says, I will arise and go to my father's house. And two verses later, the Bible says, and he arose. <laughs> Be careful what you say when you're talking to yourself. 
because it really doesn't matter what you say to other people and it really doesn't matter what other people say to you. What really matters is what you say when you talk to yourself because you can talk yourself into or you can talk yourself out of what God is wanting to do in your life. He said within himself, Kind of reminds me of that woman with an issue of blood. The same thing happened with her. She said within herself, if I can but touch the hem of his garment, I know I'm going to be made whole. There was something that happened in the, inside of this prodigal. He said, I'm getting up out of here. Not only that, but all of a sudden he starts rehearsing his speech. He starts rehearsing his speech for when he gets back home. Can, can I pick this thing apart? I will say to my father, Father, I have sinned against you and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your higher. You know, he's already rehearsing what he's going to say because you know what? He's, his greatest fear is rejection. His greatest fear is if he tries to go back home that his father's going to be waiting out there in the front talking about, I told you not to take that money and blow it. I told you if you left here with all that, what was going to happen to you? And see, the enemy's playing both sides against the middle. The prodigal's in a hog pen and the devil's saying, he don't want you no more. He don't care nothing about you any longer. He don't want to see you ever again. You blew everything he gave you. And what he don't know is on the other side of the fault line is a father that's waking up every day and going out on the porch God I wish I had the strength to preach it and he's looking down across the horizon and he's thinking I wonder if today might be the day ah! every person he sees coming toward the house he's wondering Is that my son? Every ambulance that you pass, you wonder. Is that my son in that accident? He's looking every day for his son, and yet the devil is over there putting his son under a guilt trip that nobody loves you and nobody wants you, and you have no place to go. I want to talk to every prodigal in this room. I want to talk to every prodigal that may be watching me online. Let me tell you, there is a loving father. And you got to stop seeing him as a judge. And you got to start seeing him as a loving father. Because I'm going to tell you, he's been waiting on you for 20 years to come home. He's been waiting on... Maybe today will be the day. See, it's fear that tells you he don't want you no more. It's really fear that tells you that you're going too far and you stayed too long. The truth of the matter is the father wants his son to come home. And he doesn't want a servant. He wants his son. I got four minutes to close. But the Bible said that when the father saw him a great ways off, he wasn't in the choir yet. He wasn't on the deacon board. He, he wasn't taking up the offering. No, he was still addicted. He was still sticking like pot. He was still... He still had needle tracks up and down his arms. He was still a long way off. But when the father saw him, yet a long, yet a long way off. Ah. My voice is failing me, but I'll just talk to you. The father saw him. And the Bible said, I love this. I love this right here. The Bible said, Marcus, he ran. Good God. I mean, you got to be serious when you're an old man and you run into something. I'm 49 years old. I don't run. 
I ain't running. If you see me running at you, either throw out your arms or duck. Because I'm coming. <laughs> what would make this old man run? God sent me here to tell you. <laughs> if they're not even close to being right yet. If you see him coming, somebody needs to welcome him home. Ah. Come on, legacy, stand up on your feet and throw a praise in the air. What made the prodigal's father run was no matter the mistakes that he'd made, no matter what he had done, the prodigal was still his son. What does the father say? Bring me the best robe. Kill that fatty calf. Go in there looking at jewelry box. Bring me a ring. I'm gonna put it on his finger. And we're about to have a celebration. For this my son was dead. And he is alive again. I need somebody to praise God in advance. For every prodigal that's getting ready to find their way back home this year. Come on, praise him. I want you to praise him like they're already at the altar. Praise him like they're already standing in the water. Praise him like they're already being filled. Like they're all... Maybe one person in this building that don't know Jesus Christ. Ah. Somebody watching me, you may have never made that decision. But I want to tell you right now in closing that he's been waiting for you. I want to ask my prayer team to come church if you'll get ready to push I'm going to get ready to pull there were times where Jesus would leave the 90 and 9 and he'd reach for that one person I want to ask this church to turn me loose to be the evangelist here for just a moment because I want to reach for somebody in this house You've been putting it off. You've been saying maybe later. Down the road, around the bend. Pastor, I'm waiting till I get my act right. I'm, I'm, I'm waiting till I get some stuff straight. No. The whole need now a physician. You don't get right to get God. You get God to help you get right. Don't let the enemy sit on your shoulder and tell you you got to be this and you got to be that or you can't come. No. I've seen them come with needle tracks up and down their arms. I've prayed with them with liquor on their breath. I've prayed with people who are dying of HIV and saw them in their last days come to know Jesus. I want to tell somebody it's never too late to come home. 